hi everyone. Um, I am Tanishri Gupta from Food System Integrity Team from New Zealand, and we are based in Palmerston North, which is on the North Island of New Zealand. Um, so we have we have been working on dairy microbiology, meat microbiology, even water quality a lot. But uh, having a bit of a background on that side, we have also started working on some natural antimicrobial production from bacteria. Now, I was invited to talk about one of the review papers uh, my PhD student published, and it was specifically on the antimicrobial production by anaerobes, and uh, particularly the Clostridium species. So we, when we talk about different antimicrobials or natural antimicrobial um, compounds, we always have in our mind that what is actually the need for it, right? So I'll just move this one here, sorry. Um, so we know that antibiotic resistance is increasing uh, tremendously. And somewhere we have to, I'm not saying blame, but global warming or climate change has a lot to do with it, right? So talking about antimicrobial resistance, talking about the evolution of bacteria each decade, each minute, that all contributes for a need of a new compound, whether it is synthetic or natural. Okay, so with synthetic, what happens is obviously now we are moving towards more eco-friendly compounds. And with the synthetic ones, there are a lot more resistance within microorganism. And again, it goes back to global warming, which um, uh, integrates more pathogenicity from either virus, as we know with COVID cases we are having at the moment, not even that, but bacteria evolved, fungus evolved. So all of these have their opportunity to come up and evolve during this, this time. So when we talk about different uh, diseases, not only human, but it may affect plants and then what next? Synthetic people are going away from synthetic compounds. So there is more and more need of natural compounds because we believe that it may fight antibiotic resistance. And then coming from New Zealand, even though we have a lot more rain, a lot, lot more winter season, but if you look into the differences between the two sides, we are estimating that the 2021 summer, which has already started, till March or April 2022, there will be a huge difference between the temperature and we are expecting more droughts, more higher temperature all across uh, New Zealand. So that might shift or that might change the need or upcoming of the diseases and we should be prepared with it. So as part of that, um, we have come into a colloquium that we need more natural compounds. So why not start looking at other bacteria, specifically anaerobic bacteria? So um, if you all are aware, um, a lot of work has been done on identifying and characterization of bacterial antimicrobials. So and a lot to be um, connected to streptomyces and the most famous lactic acid bacteria. However, anaerobic bacteria has been largely neglected, mostly because um, their growth conditions is highly challenging. So you have to have familiar you have to have proper growth conditions so that you can grow those anaerobes and get the antimicrobial compounds out. Not only that, but it has also been associated with some negative imaging, uh, specifically with Clostridium species uh, that they cause and they produce a lot of toxins, for example, perfringens, uh, Clostridium botulinum or difficile. Yes, there are, but a lot of percentage of Clostridium species are actually saprophytes and they live within our gut, they live happily, friendly way in our environment. So it most of or the maximum of these species don't actually cause any 
any disease or they don't produce that much of toxins. So why that has been that it is largely neglected. Now, if you look into some studies, and I have quoted only two at the moment, um, a lot of work was done in 1960s or 1970s where they found or isolated and detected bacteriocins from non-pathogenic Clostridium species. Okay, um, but after that, they stopped. So the maximum you'll get is from 1980s. And after that, they have stopped working on anaerobes. Now, it is duly just because it was um, highly challenging to grow them and um, extract the, the antimicrobial component or just they wanted to move out um, because they, they might have found or the researchers might have found that bacillus was easier to grow and they were spore forming bacteria as well, then why not work more on that? Um, so late 2000s or in the 2000s era, um, the whole computational uh, genomics or genetic approaches came into light. And with the advent of those technologies, uh, people started working or the researchers started working more and finding more antimicrobials from Clostridium botulinum, um, for instance, and some others like Clostridium cellulolyticum, cellulovorans. And just because on the basis of the upcoming computational um, tools and the lab adapted uh, growth conditions, um, we were able to to generate a manuscript, a review in which we could gather some of the important information and show that um, Clostridium could be a viable source of antimicrobials. And not to forget, lately it has come to our notice that Clostridium species, specifically Clostridium butyricum, can also be used as probiotics. And it has been seen to increase the immunity and uh, growth performance in fish tilapia, um, in broilers, they have increased digestive um, function, growth performance has been increased, um, immu immunity has been increased in chickens. And not only that, it has also increased um, the, um, the gut function of human beings as well. So this Miaricin are uh, the tablets uh, which are from Clostridium butyricum and is, is available in market and uh, that has been used by human beings for a good gut system and also it has been found that Clostridium butyricum miari 588 which is actually linked to these tablets they are um, associated as anti-cancerous agents as well. So obviously looking into so much of data, we think and uh, we hypothesize that there is a lot to still look into um, Clostridium uh, species and see what they can produce. So, so far we have we have known that a lot could be done in lab and how you can modulate the culture-based methodologies to enhance or to identify antimicrobial compounds from Clostridium species. So the benefit of using Clostridium species on top of that they are spore, former, uh, spore formers and you can actually work as such with the spores. You don't have to rely on getting the vegetative cells. Um, so yes, they are anaerobes, but most of the Clostridium species can grow in 10% oxygen as well. So you can very well utilize that those growth conditions um, to explore or to detect some antimicrobials. So the, what I was saying that the 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 most important bit about Clostridium to look into is that they survive um, it's, as compared to other environmental bacteria and um, bacillus spore forming uh, species, they can actually survive in, in environmental conditions way better than other uh, bacteria. And it is just because they have got a variety of metabolic pathways because they have to switch on different metabolic pathways when they are in a farm environment, when they are in soil, when they are in gut. So they can actually modulate their metabolic pathways. So that indicates that if they can modulate their metabolic pathways, there are more chances that they can switch on and off their variety of biochemical pathways within themselves. And that might switch on some of the pathways that may produce antimicrobials. 
Now, when it comes down to culture-based methods in the lab, it is highly challenging to, to cope or to get what the environmental conditions are for thriving these bacteria. But some research has found that you can actually add a few bits to your lab conditions to enhance the production of antimicrobials. And one such um, good example is actually you can see on the bottom of your light, right hand side that when they were giving the standard fermentation culture conditions to Clostridium cellulolyticum, there wasn't any bacteria in production. So this Clostheomide is one of the antimicrobial compounds um, which was supposed to be produced from this um, organism, but it wasn't. And they also tried different nutrition stress, different antibiotic temperature, pH stress, and they were looking for if there could be a possibility of producing clostidiumide, uh, but actually they couldn't. But what happened? They got a, an aqueous soil mixture. They they uh, sterilized it, and then when they added into the culture co condition to the cell uh, Clostridium cellulolyticum, boom, there was this production of Clostheomide. So, and not only that, people have also shown that if they added fecal material or just a solution of human feces in water and added it to their cult culture conditions, um, the sporulation of Clostridium species, and this is particularly with Clostridium cellulolyticum again, the sporulation increased uh, enhanced like around 300 times and it also down regulated its motility as well as toxin production also they have uh, shown that if there is an antibiotic treatment for c difficile in in your gut it utilizes succinate to produce butyrate <clears throat> which actually aided its its growth or it's, it, it enhanced the population of Clostridium difficile in gut. So that's why it is suggested that you have to be very careful that for how long you are given antibiotic treatment for, because you might be treating some other disease or other um, medical condition or um, bacterial uh, condition, but actually you are enhancing the population of Clostridium difficile. And then not only the antibiotic uh, treatment, but it is also shown that it uh, produces paracrisol, which is a bacteriostatic compound, and it enhances its survivabil uh, survivability of Clostridium difficile over uh, E. coli, other bacteroids, as well as Cle um, Klebsiella um, oxytoca. So, as I mentioned earlier, in late 2000, we have seen a boom of uh, antimicrobial compound discoveries from um, Clostridium species. So, three major ones are Clostheomide, which was the first ever antimicrobial, which was detected in, um, and it is part of Polythiomide class, and it has been detected from Clostridium cellulolyticum, and it was active against um, uh, methylacin resistant Steph, uh, Steph aureus, as well as vancomycin resistant enterococci strains. It was active against a wide range of of gram-positive bacteria, but not so much against E. coli, right? The next one is the clostridium, which was the first polyketide being found from clostridium difficile. And it was effective against, again, MRSA, vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, as well as mycobacterium. Similarly, clostridolin was also um, a... Um, detected and identified from Clostridium bitterenchi, which was also reported as antimicrobacterial. Um, then, as you, um, as you shifted to more of the late 2000s, there was a huge range of different tools for genome mining, which actually threw a lot of focus and light on some of the gene clusters, which are known as biosynthetic gene clusters, and they are related to the, the identification, I wouldn't say the production at the moment, uh, it is just the identification or detection of 
different ribosomal synthes uh, synthesized plus um, translationally modified peptides, polyketides, non-ribosomal peptides, like different antibiotics and bacitracins, these all and niacin, these all come under the, these categories. Um, they have been identified. So the gene clusters for these particular antimicrobial compounds were identified using genome mining tools. And this has actually elaborated that how you can identify and differentiate between environmental strains to the uh, human disease or human related strains and they have seen a huge difference between the same species of clostridium but each strain might have a different set of biosynthetic gene clusters for um, RIPPS or polyketides or non-ribosomal uh, peptides. So what these genome tools do, they take the whole genome sequence from each bacteria or each species. Then you use, um, an, or you can either use online tool like anti-smash or art, or you can very well uh, use some of the um, designed tools, which, um, which you need to download it from the internet. It is not freely available, but you definitely need a bioinformatician along with you to deduce what type of gene clusters you can identify. So you take the whole genome from um, your um, microorganisms um, data, then you put through that genome, the whole genome sequence to those online or specific tools. And then you can straight away see that which gene clusters you can actually look for. And this, this particular FSO1, FS2.2, these are actually our isolates. And we, we actually found a range of bacteriocin, a range of <clears throat> ribosomally synthesized post, translationally modified peptides, um, SACT peptides, which come under RIP. PPS and a couple of them had polyketide uh, gene cluster. Now, they do identify the gene clusters, but we haven't gone that far that we can act, that these tools can actually tell you whether, whether they produce something. It is just because not many people have been working on it. So the database to which these tools consign or identify which cluster it might be associated with because they the data is not so fully enriched at the moment they can only link to the the present RIPPS examples or polyketide examples, whether it's a bacteriocin or whether it's a polyketide. So it might end up, so if you put your sequence into it, they might tell you that it is 30% similar to such and such or 40% similar, but those percentage are really low. So it might indicate that there is a possibility that it is a new compound that you are looking for. So there are still a lot of gaps which needs to be filled in, right? Um, so on the basis of these genome tools, we found or con containing all the different uh, reviews and lit uh, uh, literature survey, we found that there is a possibility that approximately 75% of the Clostridium species are actually capable of, of producing PKS like polyketides or non-ribosomal peptides. But it all comes down to that how we can identify those. OK, so as I mentioned earlier, so we have a huge range of gene clusters, but we can't really be sure that those gene clusters encode for the products because those genes could be silent or could be down regulated. So we need to come up with a strategy which might induce the expression of those gene clusters to produce those products or antimicrobial. And one big example is what previously I have just mentioned that you need to give some, some um, inducers so that they start producing those antimicrobial compounds. And when I was talking about the differences in the species, if you can see this correct um, nicely, you see you do have have Clostridium, the same species, but the strains are different, but they produce different RIPPS uh, products. One is lengthy peptide, the another one could be something else. Similarly, if you look down on your left hand side, perfringens, for instance, that kind one strain could be producing lesopeptide, the another one can be producing lectocosin, which is um, other type of RIPP. Um, and, and then another huge range of different antimicrobial 
gene clusters you can actually identify from Clostridium species. So moving forward, so we did ident uh, we did do a, a quick search and saw that the ones what we see from Clostridium, is it very similar? Those gene clusters, are those very similar to other known gene clusters or biosynthetic gene clusters from known bacteria such as Bacillus or lactic acid bacteria? So we used a online tool which is called AntiSmash and it is freely available. You can use it for fungi, you can use it for any other um, and, uh, bacterial uh, a species and have a big search. So what we found, and we took an example of Clostridium cellulovorans 743b genome, and we targeted lengthy peptide biosynthetic gene clusters. And we saw that it sat really uniquely around Clostridium cellulovorans, and it wasn't that that um, that protein or the peptide composition wasn't really any way closer to Bacillus species. And if you look into this tree, into this map, you won't see lactic acid bacteria anywhere in this. So it was very much specifically, I would say, to a spore forming cluster. But again, within a spore forming cluster, it was way away from the Bacillus serious group, but it was very much closely related to Clostridium species and that too very much much unique to cellulovorans. So there, there could be a possibility that the, the, this, these gene clusters are very specific to strain, very specific to species, but then on the other hand, they could be a very novel type of antimicrobials um, gene clusters. So we have to look into more in details and whosoever works around it have to be very careful what they are dealing with. So there are certain challenges, but then we have opportunities as well with the advent of whole genome sequencing. Uh, the challenges are that we really don't know that what these biosynthetic gene cluster might be translating into, right? What compound? Because as I mentioned earlier, we have limited resource, we have limited knowledge around uh, what's in the database. So we have to do more and more studies so that we keep filling up the, that database and people can use that resource or that reservoir to analyze their data and see what the similarity is, okay? So that's the main challenge. And uh, then again, that um, the existing database doesn't have much information around Clostridium species. <clears throat> so what we need to do is we need to generate more information using genome mining around potential biosynthetic gene cluster and need to prioritize on the known ones or on the um, biosynthetic gene clusters, which codes for certain antimicrobial compounds so that when we start doing some of, some of our experimental designs that it reduces our time and cost, okay? Then tools such as ARTS, apart from using anti-SMASH, you can use antibiotic resistance target seeker, CDD, PRISM, that can give you a prediction of what secondary metabolites you, um, you might be uh, detecting CDD is uh, it's really good and it understands the chemical structure which could be associated with the product so you may have a little bit of knowledge or an idea that what kind of structure of the antimicrobial compound you may end up getting and then you can do a quick search around that what homolog or what analog you can find around that structure and it could indicate what antimicrobial product you might be getting so, so what at the end, I would say that if you com combine the genomics and the culture-based approach, then you can very well <clears throat> understand the whole pathway and see that what antimicrobial compound you might be getting. So this, uh, the gray side is this, the simple conventional approach you'll be taking, isolating the cultures from the environment screen for what antimicrobial compound you might be getting using some um, screening tools um, and seeing what uh, which bacteria do they kill and then you isolate and you can introduce metabolomics here or proteomics here. You can isolate that um, compounds and then do more uh, of a serious search and see what um, chemical structure those compounds have and then look for putative antimicrobials. On the other hand, you can actually use the genomic data. You can use online tools to see what genome uh, or what 
gene clusters you may get and then what it might be looking into. And once you know that you have an idea that this is coming out to be similar to such and such, which is already um, present in the database, then you can tweak your uh, environmental conditions in the lab or in your lab conditions and then start screening and isolating those compounds as mentioned in the conventional approach. At the end, I would like to conclude that, um, yes, there are difficulties, are challenges to look into novel antimicrobial compounds, but Clostridium, because they have a variety of um, places that or uh, they can survive so they have evolved their microbial or metabolic pathway so they are a good source of looking into natural antimicrobial compound synthesis so a lot more research needs to be done there are limited research um, on the indication of uh, putative antimicrobial peptide and secondary metabolite from clostridium species but with the advent of genome mining tools and genomics knowledge in combination with some improved and modified culture methods, we may explore more and more antimicrobial compounds from Clostridium species. Um, and then incorporation of those ecological niche in the uh, laboratory system, we might enhance or induce the silent chain, which may again improve the bioactive or antimicrobial synthesis um, in anaerobic bacteria. Then more importantly, we need to be very specific about the molecular approaches, what we are using. Um, and you can also use modeling, epigenetic remodeling or heterologous expression or um, more and easily that um, would be the activation of the pathway of those biosynthetic gene clusters along with optimized growth conditions um, which can promote the expression of those biosynthetic gene clusters to promote or to produce antimicrobial compounds. Um, at the end, I would like to acknowledge and thank the International Conference on Microbiology and Infectious Diseases to invite me to present this work, what we have been doing, um, and a very big thanks to Amela, who is my PhD student and who has moved to uh, Aarhus University to do postdoc, and this whole anaerobic bacteria and antimicrobial extraction from Clostridium was his PhD. Um, Kwang, who has worked a lot around uh, this work doing antimicrobial screening tests. Dr. Gail Brightwell, who is our team leader, Professor Liang Li, who did all the metabolomics and is um, in University of Alberta. And of course, our Agri-Research Fund, who has funded this um, study. Thank you. Any questions? I can see someone raised their hand. Yeah, can you please? Talk. Yeah. Hi, Tanushree. This is Vishwambar from India. Hi. So, yeah. So, as you mentioned, this Clostridium, it uh, mostly acting against the gram positive pathogens, right? And very partially acting against the gram negative. So, based on you, your experience, what, what will be the reason behind this? It more acting against the gram positive. Uh, so what, what has happened is this was, I have given you an example of only um, a particular, um, a, uh, what do you say, antimicrobial compounds at the moment, clostheomide or clostribin and clostridinone, right? So yeah. it, it could be that it depends, it's the activity, the mode of activity is different, right? And because we know that gram-negative um, may be an, an easy target because even though they have a complex cell uh, cell membrane uh, and cell wall but it is easier to target gram positive because their lipid and uh, the protein uh, combination is very different but i will give you a heads up the the study what we have done so far as part of my PhD students um, PhD um, which i haven't showed it here because i was supposed to um, present the, re re the review paper we have got, but we have found some antimicrobial compounds which were equally active against gram-negative. So it is just depends on what antimicrobials you are looking for, um, but there are a lot more other new compounds and some of the remaining ones which have never been targeted earlier, but they are equally active against um, bacteria, um, all sort of bacteria. 
but I think it has to do with the cell membrane. We haven't looked into because we didn't work on clostheomide and um, they haven't actually um, worked on that. What was the mode of action? They just showed that this is coming out for the first time from clostridium, um, dif uh, sorry, uh, cellular lyticum, for instance, for clostheomide. Um, but no, what was actually the um, activity, wh where it was actually acting was, wasn't found. Yes, Martha. Yes, um, you were describing the use of clostridium in uh, cancer. Have you, um, which, which types of cancer are more susceptible to this type of treatment? No, we haven't. Actually, it wasn't oh. us who have worked. It is oh, a okay. part of lit uh, literature search. Okay. Yes, yes. But um, if I look into it, actually, they were anti-tumorous and they enhanced neutrophils through MMP8 okay, pathway. Yeah. Is, was, was that, was that um, when they took it by mouth? Uh, which one? Those this ones? One, the I, one where they advanced the neutrophils. So was that uh, IV injections, part of like what they call a cobalt? <clears throat> no, no, no. This was just by ingestion. This was, um, I think, just on the uh, cellular level. So they did an in vitro cell line studies. Okay, great. Thank you so yes. much. Thank yeah, you. so they, these studies actually, until and unless they have actually worked on specifically animal models like broilers or fish or um, other bits, they haven't actually worked on against the uh, anti-cancerous. They hasn't. They haven't worked on patient as such. On patients, they have only used uh, these tablets, the Miaricin tablets. And they have actually shown that in some of the patient, it has um, enhanced the gut microbiota and gut health. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Tanushi, one more question. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Particularly, this, uh, if you see these organisms, mostly these bacteriocins are the responsible for antimicrobial activity, right? Yes. And uh, apart from this bacteria, also actually we are also working on the lactic acid bacteria. So mm -hmm. we got the bacteria seen also and some other metabolites also. And mm -hmm. even the peptides, uh, small peptides also, they are uh, acting a good as a antimicrobial agent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so but. If you see compared to bacteria since like this metabolite, their purification and characterization is like a streaky job. So can you suggest something to uh, purify and characterize this uh, secondary metabolites produced by this bacteria? Uh, well, because our work, our, I, I would say that overall, our, all over the work we have done, we have looked for metabolites. And actually, metabolomics is not a tricky bit. Um, it is it is easier than looking for the small peptides because the small peptides it's really challenging to actually bind to the columns. So I would suggest if you're looking for bacteriocins, uh, well and good because you have got established protocols to to work with bacteriocins. But with metabolites, um, have you worked with peptides so far? Have uh, you looked into it, peptides? Not, not yet. Not it. Okay, so with metabolomics, you can actually use a way the similar LCMS liquid chromatograph mm -hmm. along with mass spec. So you you can actually phase out. You can use different columns, and it is it is equipped well equipped now. You can send your um your whole extract to different service provider and they can fractionate out. So fractionation using LCMS has become really easy and you can get individual fraction and then test those metabolites around uh, looking into which one gives you the antimicrobial properties. So it, it is easy. It's not a tricky job now. You can use um, LCMS very easily and that's what we have done. Okay, and see, uh, uh, suppose some like novel antimicrobial agents are there, those are not reporting some library or yeah. anything. So that yes. how will identify or characterize that molecule? Yes, so that area that still needs to uh, need to be developed a lot because um, you need a combination of LCMS, but of a high quality. Along with it, you need NMR. 
which a lot of people don't have. And you need to know using the genome tools that what putative indication you are actually getting that it could be a possibility that it is indicating that it is either a bactericin or it is a RPS or polyketide. And then you give different shots. Um, it, it, it is challenging, I have to say, because we think with our Clostridium species, we have got a huge range of novel compounds, but we are still struggling to get the best shot um, with X-ray crystallography, uh, the CDT to work that what chemical compound structure yeah. we might get yeah. and along with it, NMR. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Like the same things we are now currently we are following, we are uh, purifying through this uh, silica column and then yeah. we are giving for uh, NMR, XRD, LC, HRMS. So same problem we are facing, but this separation of this compound is a really tricky job because we are sometimes we are getting the mixture of compounds. So it's uh, NMR, you are not getting the pure uh, peaks in NMR. So that's why we are stuck in here. So you are saying that you're not getting NM, uh, from NMR. Is it the novel compound you're talking about or is it the secondary metabolites? Yeah, it is a novel compound. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, yes. you have to paraphrase uh, completely. Yes, I, I totally understand. So are you specifically working? Oh, no, you said you're working with lactic acid bacteria. Now, that's the other thing, because people don't work on the novel compounds. So you really can't get anything because the data is really restricted. So the database, until or unless database is not enriched, people are not putting their um, their compounds in there. It would be really tricky. Right. It is possible, but it has to be done with lots of combination and permutations unfortunately at this point yeah okay thanks for your suggestions we'll see the and in yes. future also yes. we are looking for like uh, your area and our area is like similar kind of we are working on the natural products so in future if we need some help so definitely yes you can contact me we can um i think you can get my email address from isabel uh, yeah. who has been organizing this um I, yeah, yeah. I have, I, I got it. You wanna, we have one communication about this conference with this mail ID. So, okay. We never, yes, uh, yes. You can be in touch. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And uh, okay, we'll be happy you. to help you. Yeah. Thank yep. you very much. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you so much. So it's uh, all good to stop presenting. Yeah, it's fine. And thank you for your patience and your valuable suggestions to the uh, budding researchers in India. And we have one more final uh, lecture for the day from Dr. Jamie from United States. Uh, once we have done that lecture for the day, we'll close that. And you can expect your certificates by tomorrow end of the day. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.